Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we're continuing our unit on the colonization of the Middle Colonies. Today we stay in Virginia and continue from last week's episode. Today's episode is entitled Mutiny in Virginia. It is part one of a two-part series. And obviously from the title you could tell that Governor Harvey's time as governor of Virginia goes from bad to worse in today's episode. Where we last left off was in December 1631, and there had been an agreement between the governor and the council of Virginia, which was sort of like the governor's cabinet, and that seemed to smooth things over between the two. That's really where the source of discontent was coming from. Governor Harvey continued his path towards diversifying what the colony produced and exported. He, like King Charles, wanted to move away from the dependence on tobacco. In a February 1632 letter to the Privy Council, Harvey stated that some potash had been produced and he was hoping to have some English wheat planted in Virginia later that year. Harvey wrote another note in May expressing some frustration over the tobacco monopoly that had been imposed by the crown. Specifically, he points out that tobacco trading out of New Netherland was trading at a price 18 times higher than Virginia. So what he's saying there is, the crown imposing these trade restrictions on Virginia tobacco planters had caused the price to go down because it was essentially controlling the demand side. You could only trade with England. But if you were trading uh, tobacco out of New Netherland, it was 18 times higher in price because it was more of a market trade and there was a high amount of demand outside of that controlled monopoly that England had. There wasn't much else in the writings of uh, Governor Harvey or anybody else for that matter in 1632, but Wilkham Washburn, a historian that we've covered a little bit in this podcast, stated that in 1632 the colonists were required by Harvey to plant two acres of corn per head. And that policy, even though we didn't see it primarily in the sources, would make sense because Harvey's primary complaint of, uh, of a lack of resource was in the area of corn. So Wilkham Washburn is probably looking at something that we don't have access to to make that assertion. He also mentions that the Assembly of 1632 set a fixed price of six pence per pound, likely in response to the problem that Harvey pointed out. So six pence per pound of corn in 1632. According to Washburn, the laws of Jamestown were also revised that fall, and the new laws focused on the church, tobacco, and relations with the natives. There is a uncharacteristic gap in the research, and we hear nothing else from Virginia until July 3rd of 1633, when the Privy Council writes to the colony, informing them of their approval of Lord Baltimore's land patent to the north against the objections of the Virginians. We talked about that last week. Uh, They weren't crazy about him. He was a Catholic, and they felt that uh, his beliefs were not going to be welcomed in Jamestown, and so now he is definitely going to become a neighbor. The king followed up a few days later with a letter ordering Governor Harvey to be courteous and respectful towards Lord Baltimore and to provide lawful assistance. So now Harvey's going to get into a real tough spot because his people definitely don't want that, but now the king is ordering it. One month after the king's letter, a petition went back to the Privy Council from six Virginia planters requesting King Charles reinstate the Virginia Company. 
The planters were insistent because doing so would privatize profits. So I think some of what we're seeing here is the frustration over the trade monopoly and a desire to bring more control over the affairs of Virginia back to Virginia itself. So these planters want the reinstatement of the Virginia Company, which was something else we talked about last week as well. At the same time, a letter was coming to the Virginia colonists encouraging them not to trade with the Dutch. And those folks had settled New Netherland. It is believed this was done to preserve the English monopoly of tobacco and to the benefit of a few individuals who were the only merchants within that monopoly. So again, the English are concerned about their control over the trade. If you trade with the Dutch, they could trade out to the rest of the world and essentially you would have access to market prices. So again, it would make sense to keep that trade closed. In February of 1634, Harvey and the council wrote to the Privy Council that they have plenty of corn now. In fact, they have enough to send to the aid of New England. So New England must have been having problems at that time. They also added that they have plenty of cattle and swine. The only things that they were in need of were arms and ammunition. The letter also suggests the need for a customs house as someone had been caught recently trying to smuggle goods that were from Virginia out to the Netherlands. So again, a customs house would control that trade channel. On April 28, 1634, the king made his decision about colonial government, formally organizing the commissioners for Virginia and giving them the power to, quote, remove governors and require they account for their government, also to appoint judges, establish courts, to hear and determine complaints, and to revoke any patents or charters. That decision likely killed any possibility of a new company because you saw in last week's episode they were trying to decide between this idea of commissioners or a company and essentially here the king is making the commissioner uh, job permanent last week it was temporary now it is a permanent part of the Virginia colony in July of 1634 Governor Harvey sends a letter to England describing the current state of food in the colony. Let's have a look at the letter. Every family now hath corn to spare, and great store of poultry and swine are bred, and for three years past great quantities sent for the relief of New England. This year, 10,000 bushels have been exported. Harvey has essentially turned the agricultural community in Virginia around in terms of it being able to support itself or feed itself. Before it was all tobacco, now they're growing their own food and they're able to help New England. The letter also mentions the completion of Fort Point Comfort. But there was one ominous note. Let's have a look. Meets with great opposition from his assistants. That's exactly how uh, the letter wrote, meets with great opposition from his assistants. So Harvey, again, is clearly not getting along with others in his own government. And as we pointed out last week, a lot of the people he's not getting along with are people that he did not appoint, they were already there when he arrived, and that he had no control over changing their uh, appointment. In September, a return letter comes back from Secretary Windebank recognizing Governor Harvey's positive contribution to the Maryland colony and encouraging its continuance. So Harvey has chosen to support Maryland's colonial efforts. And of course, that's going to be against what the Virginians want. The letter requests continued assistance to Lord Baltimore, and I quote this, against the malicious practices of Claiborne, 
We talked about this in our Maryland episodes where William Claiborne, who was running Kent Island, which was up in Maryland's territory, was causing issues with those Maryland colonists. At the end of the month, the king sends a letter to Governor Harvey stating that he is disappointed in the lack of progress regarding the tobacco price negotiations and that Governor Harvey should call an assembly and that the king would appoint commissioners to resolve the dispute. You know, this is going to be tough to do if everybody is not getting along with Governor Harvey. And in December, Harvey writes another letter detailing the division occurring within the Council of Virginia. Let's have a look. I must sincerely let your honor know that my power here is not great, it being limited by my commission to the greater number of voices at the council table. And there I have almost all against me in whatsoever I can propose, especially if it concerns Maryland. So there you have it. The council very much, very much opposed to the matters going on uh, in Virginia as it relates to Harvey and helping the Maryland cause. Harvey goes on to say that members of the council have said that they would rather kill their cattle than sell it to Maryland. He goes on to make another allegation. Let's have a look. The faction I find great cause to suspect is nourished from England. For this summer came letters to Captain Matthews, who is the patron of disorder. Quite the allegation here. He's saying that England... There's somebody in England that's stirring the pot up and stirring up these uh, counselors who are opposed to him. He goes on to mention secret meetings and correspondence involving some council members and Claiborne. There are several sources that we rely on here in describing this mutinous moment in Virginia history. The first comes from Captain Matthews, who supported the exile of Governor Harvey. Matthews accuses Harvey of detaining letters from King Charles and not sharing them. So there's directives coming in. Harvey is holding on to them and not sharing them, and that is getting uh, some of the council upset. Matthew said the council petitioned for the letters, only to be told by Harvey that they were assistants of the government and that he could rule alone on behalf of the king. More disagreement. Matthews goes on to accuse Harvey of selling out to Maryland, specifically when it came to selling them corn in a year when 2,000 new people came to Virginia and the food rations were needed. So Matthews is painting a different picture than what Harvey was painting, and basically he's saying that new people Coming to Virginia in the amounts that they were coming required now that corn be preserved. A April 1635 census revealed that 4,914 colonists were living in Virginia. This uh, April of 1635 was the month that things finally boiled over. According to William Claiborne's petition written that month, the Virginia colony was retrieving a stolen ship when they were fired upon by the Maryland group. The ensuing battle between Maryland and Virginia killed three Virginians. So now you have open fighting and people actually dying as a result of this discontent. Obviously, the Virginians did not like Harvey's position with Maryland. And on April 27th, a, a protest actually broke out in a shire called York in the home of a gentleman by the name of William Warren. Captain Matthews was one of the chief speakers, as was Francis Pott. We talked about Francis Pott last week and his tumultuous relationship with Governor Harvey. A man there by the name of Zouch, Z-O-U-C-H, noted that one of the speakers stated, quote, no justice was done and that the governor would, quote, bring a second massacre. So the fact that the governor did not order a retaliation and 
decided not to really do anything because of this battle, people felt more death would be coming and more fighting would be coming, and that's what led to this round of discontent. When word got back to Governor Harvey of the meeting, he requested the speakers be arrested. At a hearing, the matter of correspondence to King Charles was brought up again. This is where they're saying, hey, we're getting letters from the king and you're hoarding that information and not sharing it with anybody else. A member of the council asked Harvey why he had not sent back a reply of the assembly in regards to the king's tobacco offer. Now, if you've been following the podcast for a while, there is a disagreement between King Charles and the planters of Virginia over the price of tobacco. And basically what's being accused here is that uh, Governor Harvey did not reply to an offer that King Charles made. Harvey responds by requesting that the man be arrested for treason. Two men charge at Governor Harvey actually getting their hands on him and told him that he should be charged with treason. This is all according to the gentleman that I'm referring to as Zouch. He also claimed that uh, Harvey pushed them back and told them to step away due to their passion for the subject. Matthews, now Captain Matthews, who's another source here, claims that he stepped in to keep the governor from hurting one of the other men after the governor had already struck him once. After a pause in everything, Captain Matthews is quoted as saying, let's have a look at the writing. Sir, the people's fury is up against you. And to appease it is beyond our power, unless you please to go for England, there to answer their complaints. So basically, Matthews is telling him to go back to England. Harvey replied that he would not leave unless the king ordered him to do so. After some back and forth here, Harvey basically asked the council, who is not on his side, what they wanted, and they replied that they wanted him to go back the next day. Zouch goes on to mention that approximately 40 men were preparing their muskets that night. So we're about to have potentially a firefight going on here in Virginia over this madness. The next morning, the council requested Governor Harvey return to England, and he refuses. So the temperature just keeps going up. That evening, Zouch and Governor Harvey receive information that the governor's life might be in danger. You would think that after you've got uh, 40 men preparing muskets. They discuss it, Zouch and the governor, and decide that now it is best for Governor Harvey to go back to England. Matthews, Captain Matthews, adds in his letter that the danger came from the general populace and not the council. He added that the council agreed that there was a danger to the governor. So people apparently had gotten so fired up that there was a fear that basically a mob was going to form here. The next day, the governor met the council and decided that he was going to go back to England. He requested in exchange that they cease hostility towards Maryland, that they would allow him to nominate the acting governor until the king can appoint someone, and that three of the council members would accompany him to England. So this is interesting. I mean, he's making these requests. And uh, the council rejects Harvey's requests and then issues a public statement saying that Harvey is resigning and going back to England. So... So much for trying to negotiate this out. They basically said no, and then they went out and blabbed to everybody that Governor Harvey was leaving. John West, and you might remember that last name, West. He is the younger brother of Francis West and the younger brother of the late Thomas West, Lord de la War. And he is named acting governor. 
So John West steps in. Harvey leaves for England on May 25th, 1635. The same day that Captain Matthews sits and writes his account. So it's assumed that Matthews probably sent that writing back with Harvey. So Sir John Harvey is out as governor and pretty much not by choice, although he kind of was pressured into choosing so at the end, and he is headed back to England. It is kind of similar to uh, John Endicott, who was the first governor of Virginia, and we talked about that many moons ago on the podcast, but this one has more of an air to, to possible danger and violence to it. So how are the English going to react to this? And what is going to happen within the Virginia colony? Because remember, this is only part one of mutiny in Virginia. There's more to this story. And we'll cover that next week on Historical Context.